125. These kids range in age from 13 to 17 years old. Remarkably, all of them with years of internet experience and exposure. Is it too much, too soon, too explicit, too detailed, no. too pornographic, no, for too young they, of an age? It's going to happen no matter what they do, and the more restraint they put on the parents, the adults, the community puts yeah. on it, the more you're going to want to do it. And the fact is they're going to look at it at some point in their life. So whether they see it while they're at their best friend's house or, while they, or whether they see it on their computer, it's not going to make much of a difference. Alarmed parents can install blocking software designed to deny their kids access to offensive internet sites. But only 20% do, and none of it is 100% effective. Could I have a show of hands of those of you who have parental controls of some type on your computers so you cannot access, say, X-rated type material? Raise your hand, everyone who does. I used Nobody. to. I don't, I, I never have. To. I never have either. Well, they, why not? Because You're they, they, a child. I know, but they trust, they trust me well, they enough trust. to know that I'm not going to do that. You've got to take the good and the bad, and you can't just block it out, because for every website you block with pornography on it, three go up the next day that you haven't blocked. It's impossible to keep up with. Consider, across this country, more than half the kids from 12 to 17 are using the Internet. More are joining every day mostly to chat, to join ongoing interactive conversations about anything, often with complete strangers. It's here that a door is open to a more dangerous set of problems. If you put your computer in your child's bedroom and you leave them alone, then what you're doing is you are, you're inviting strangers to come into your child's bedroom. That's like, it's like mom and dad going out, opening the front door and leaving it open and just saying to the street outside, hey, come in and play with my child. And I'm just going to type... Gabriel says, ban the perverts, not the kids. Gabriel Hatcher teaches computer safety and is deeply concerned that most kids don't have the street smarts to navigate through cyberspace safely. If you let your kids go online, they are going to meet sexual predators. There's no two ways about this. They will meet sexual predators. So Gabriel and his Cyber Angels organization offer some 50 hours a week of street smart education to kids and adults right over the computer. How many people here have ever been hit on while online? Wisteria says, I once had to change my nickname four times and eventually leave the internet because of an online predator. How many of you have been in a chat room and something that was provocative, perhaps um, adult rated, so to speak, popped up in the conversation or on the screen? So you've all run into it. He started like spitting out like really sexual comments and he was like, I want to meet you. And I'm like, I don't think so. And I signed off and I like left the computer and I didn't go back on American Online for a while, afraid that he might have taken my name and looked for me. I'm going to ask them, how do we recognize a sexual predator online? A predator will generally go right for the personal questions, male or female, age, maybe ask what you're wearing, kind of like an obscene phone call. Wisteria says, Gabe, one alarm question is, are you alone? That's very observant. Are you alone? Knowing what the risks are and how to protect yourself is critical for kids to safely navigate the Internet. Never give your name, phone number, address, any information that could lead a predator to your door. And tell your parents if you're hit on. How many of you here have ever gone to your parents and said, whoa, Dad, guess what I just ran into on the Internet? <laughs> No Be way. honest. No. I, I no wouldn't. He would probably it. take it off. No way. Class, I'd probably take it off. If my parents found out, as much as I think they're aware of that, I think they would definitely be more weary of it. They'd, they'd probably have me on the computer less. And it's really a utility that I benefit from a lot. Kids know if they tell their mother that they have, they have been involved in a sexual conversation, the parents will be angry with the child, the plug will be pulled, the internet will be cancelled, no more chat. Do you meet a lot of 14-year-olds that way? When predators are there, they're looking for a chance to make personal contact. A man arrives to meet a young boy at the Portland airport. They first met on the internet. Only this young boy is a decoy arranged by a reporter. I'm actually the guy who you were talking to. The reporter had posed as Bryce from Vancouver, age 14. The meeting was arranged in cyberspace. Once confronted, Marcus, his screen name, explained why he had come. Listen to this. The single motivating factor was to come up here 
and meet someone who was young and male for sex. To a lot of people, that will sound downright creepy. I bet it will, and it is. And that's why parents need to watch their kids. And that's why police have finally begun to pay increased attention to the Internet. Just three days ago, this was the scene in Buffalo. Hundreds of law enforcement officers learning how to confront crimes in cyberspace. Veteran detective Robert Farley already knows. At the Cook County Sheriff's Department in Chicago, I'm 13. He's online pretending to be a 13-year-old girl. Kathy, 13, is his screen name, and she is being hunted. Uncle Russ, it says. I'm 35. Is that too old for you? And your measurements, little one? I'm too little to measure. And here he's saying, maybe I could measure. Where are you at? Farley is a pioneer in this new age of cyber cops. Specially trained and equipped to police the internet. We protect their identities so they can continue to work undercover. When I see chat rooms that deal with preteen sex or forced family sex or children under 12 having sex, and you can have 100 people in there talking about it. As a police officer and as a parent, it scares the heck out of me. How difficult is it for you to find these conversations going on? Not difficult at all. Within minutes? Within minutes. And these online seductions are leading to arrests, like recently in Chicago. I portrayed myself as a female child. He graphically uh, explained what he wanted to do with me and then said uh, he would drive from New York to here. He had a map of Chicago. Uh, he picked the location out. He picked the mall out. And the next day, he showed up about 20 minutes after 2. He had told us he would be wearing a, a purple top and then he would have a cap with the letters HBO on it. We found the baseball cap along with handcuffs, leg restraints, arm restraints, dog collars, different things that would be used to restrain or bind an individual. This individual is being held without bail as a danger to the community. Predators Farley has found are looking for a very specific target. They're looking for that child that is not the leader they're looking for that child maybe from a single parent family. They're looking for that child that has the lack of self-esteem. And what they'll do is they'll sit there and they'll go in a private room and they'll build this child up and then lower their inhibitions, hoping that they can meet him. Uh, like this California man who had just been arrested for having sex with a 15-year-old girl he met on the Internet and lured all the way from Florida. Unexpectedly, he welcomes reporters into his home. This here is the culprit. Welcome to the internet, folks. How'd you meet her? Same way I meet everybody else. He claims to have met dozens of people this way. Hundreds. Did you have sex with her? No. 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 Well, no. yes, he did, no. said the girl, no. and no. yes, he did, no. said the courts. He's now serving five years in prison for having sex with a minor. <sighs> the dangerous reality of the power of this new medium over impressionable young minds was brought home in New Jersey. A boy only 15 years old allegedly murdered a younger child. As the authorities unraveled the mystery, they found the 15-year-old had snapped after a homosexual affair with an older man he had met in an internet chat room. It's quickly emerged as a national dilemma. How do we protect kids and still allow them to explore the wonders of the internet? John Ryan represents anyway, America Online, one of the largest providers of access for the Internet. The solution is not monitoring the activities of members online. The solution is the implementation and use of the parental controls. Parents can determine where their children go online and, more importantly, where they do not go. For its 10 million customers, America Online is offering the newest parental controls easy to use, and designed to restrict access to the Internet according to the age and maturity of children. While this can be a good start, the World Wide Web is huge, and no one knows who is going to clean up the Internet, root out the predators and the pedophiles who have made such a comfortable home there. We're there to easily put a stop to it, and we have, and we will. We will shut down the rooms, we will turn these people in until it stops one way or another. Meet Sean Ramirez. He has no badge, no authority. That's criminal. 
Just a full dose of outrage and a computer. And um, America Online, they have rooms, hundreds of rooms, each catering to somebody's whim, and all it takes is a click of a button and boom, you're there. You're exposed. From his living room in a Los Angeles suburb, Ramirez leads a group called The Underground in a campaign to disrupt chat rooms where child pornography is traded. They jump right in. Laws are recited back on the screen to the offenders, and evidence is collected and forwarded to the authorities. When all else fails, they use an electronic warfare system they've developed called punting. They send a jamming signal that can temporarily kick the offenders offline and clear out the chat rooms. That room fam fun, it was up for over eight hours. I came and shut it down, and they said I couldn't do a damn thing. I shut it down. A user, somebody who pays to be on this service, then what we are is just people who care, people who want to see this put to an end by any means necessary. And even if we have to pull such childish and underhanded tactics as punting people offline, we'll do it. I mean, because that's the only thing that's been really effective. When Ramirez was four, he too was sexually abused. Illegal. So it's little wonder he has declared Child. such a passionate war against pedophiles. Because it hurts. Every day I carry this, and I know that these poor children every day are being victimized, and there's nobody there to do anything about it. Um, there are, but they're few and far in between, and we're so vastly outnumbered, and that's what's so damn scary. Tom, is there any real sense yet of the magnitude of this problem? Hugh, it is as large as the WWW, World Wide Web, as it's called, all across this country and the entire world, in fact. It's out of control, and until it can be brought under control, it's up to parents to be the first and last line of defense for their children. Wouldn't it be neat if parents equipped themselves with the knowledge how to surf the Internet, do it with their children, let their children then become part of this vigilante activity against pedophiles? Experts consider that the best way. The parents have got to get in the pool, so to speak, get familiar with the computers, engage in these things themselves, then discuss it with their children. That's recommended as one of the best courses of action to take. Well, we're going to be taking a good close look at that New Jersey case that you referred to in Barbara's uh, next feature. So uh, thank you, Tom, for this one. Well, when we come back, you will see that the role of the Internet and how it played in the life of a disturbed teenager. His secret online relationship may have helped send him over the edge to murder. Tonight, for the first time, his parents talk about the whole heartbreaking ordeal. Stay with us. Internet buddy into unimaginable depravity. An innocent 11-year-old who becomes the victim of the other boy's torment. The body of a young Caucasian male, approximate age, 10 to 13 years of age, was found... Sam Manzi, the accused murderer, is now 15 years old. A year ago, he struck up an online acquaintance with this adult, Stephen Simmons. Simmons, according to court documents, enticed him into a secret homosexual relationship that lasted over a year. When the secret came out, Sam agreed to help police trap Simmons, but those plans went awry. Sam apparently snapped, and this 11-year-old, Eddie Werner, became the target of Sam's rage and shame. How could this tragedy happen in a family that seemed so filled with affection, where parenting was taken so seriously? When they went to, off to school, I was there to see him get on the school bus, and I was, see, I was there to see him get off. Sam Manzi was a loved and loving child. His parents worked hard to provide a comfortable environment and private schooling for both Sam and his older sister. Sam grew up as a loner and had some problems in adolescence. He was a bit of what other kids called a nerd and grew to be six foot one by the time he was 14. His schoolmates, sensing the sexual confusion he was feeling, called him Manzi the Pansy. Did Sam ever discuss his sexuality with you? Here he was, an adolescent, when one begins to, I guess, discover sexuality. Did he ever discuss this with you? Yeah, he did. He told me there was a possibility that he thought he might be gay. What did you say? I told him, I says, um, at that time he was only 14 years old. A lot of kids go through, you know, wondering about things like that. And it doesn't matter. If you are, you are. And you're not going to change that. And if you feel OK about it, that's the main thing. You didn't sound shocked. You didn't say how terrible, neither one of you? No. 
Sam and his sister were going to a Catholic school. The Bible says homosexuality is a sin. Was this something that was very disturbing or at all disturbing to Sam? I know he was tortured by it. And Sam knew how much I was devoted to Catholicism, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why. He didn't want you to know. Right. Better not tell Daddy. Right. Yeah. About three years ago, Sam became interested in computers. You bought him a computer. How did you feel about that? Here he was using his computer, uh, using the internet. How did you feel about that? I thought it was great. He wasn't out playing like other kids. It used to break my heart to see them out there, and, and he had nothing. So when the, the computer came into the house, it was like he had some kind of communication with somebody. Did you ever try to find out who he was communicating with, or look at his website, or see whom he might be contacting? Well, I, actually, yes. Uh, I, I had seen some of the things he was doing. He was actually playing games with other kids his, his age over the computer. You felt terrific. At last, my boy has someone he can reach out to. Sure. Yeah. One day in August of 1996, Sam asked you to drive him to a local shopping mall. Yep. He said he wanted to buy some stuff for his computer and said, I'll call your dad when I'm finished. Yes? What happened? Sam never called. So we checked all over the mall, and there was a, a theater across the way with six movie theaters in it. And we walked up and down every aisle and looked at everybody's face to see if we could locate Sam, to see if he was in there. Then we notified the Freehold police. You must have been terrified. Did you think he'd been kidnapped? Yes, I did. The next day, the phone rang, yes. and it was Sam. Yes. What did he tell you? What did Sam tell you when you finally found him? He wouldn't say anything. And I, I was just so happy to see him. I went to hug him, put my arm around him, and he pushed me away. When he got home that day, he just went right up to his room, and he closed the door. Did he ever say where he'd been? He said that uh, he just stayed in the woods all night. I said, if anybody hurt you or if anything's happened, you've got to let me know. And he wouldn't answer me. And then uh, maybe after trying for about maybe five, ten minutes, he said, um, I went to meet somebody at the mall, and they didn't show up, and I was so devastated over that, I stayed in the woods. So you thought, what, he was trying to meet some young friend and the friend mm -hmm. never showed? Yeah. Never occurred to you that anything else might have no, happened? No, had, had not you even... Crossed your mind? You yeah. were just so happy to have him back? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Sam Manzi was back home, but far from safe. A stranger had crept quietly into his life, into his bedroom, and Sam's parents were unaware of the danger. For the Manzi family, the worst was yet to come. Barbara continues after this. The internet. He was confused about his sexual identity, tortured by it, and he was lonely. Behind the closed door of his bedroom, he created his own secret world. Sam's parents would learn just how destructive that can be. Mr. Manzi, when and how did you first even know of the existence of Stephen Simmons? On our telephone bill, there was a, a, a phone number from Long Island, maybe about two, three hundred dollars worth of calls. Um, so I took the phone bill and I called the number and a person answered, and I said, who's this? And he said, this is Steve. I never knew his last name at that point. Um, and I said, your phone number is all over my son's phone. Why are you communicating with my son? And he said, well, Sam helps me out a lot uh, with computer programs and the like. And if you don't w want me to, have any more communication with him, I won't. And I said, I'd really appreciate that. And he says, okay, I won't. I said, thank you, and I hung up. You never thought this man may be sexually abusing my son? It no. never entered your mind? No. Did you ever say to him, who is Steve Simmons? I never did. Why not? I, maybe I didn't want to know. Did you wonder who it was? I asked him. And? I, and he said he was just somebody that he talks to occasionally, and um, that was no big deal. But under the surface, 
Sam was in torment. His grades, mostly A's until then, plummeted. His behavior at home became erratic. He took to bed for five weeks, puzzling his doctors. He was apparently in a deep depression. His school recommended therapy. Sam's parents were guided to Shoreline Behavioral Center, an outpatient psychiatric treatment facility. The program was intense, five and a half hours a day, five days a week, and it was expensive, $450 a day. Medical insurance paid most of it, but the Manzies had to pay $90 a day out of pocket. Now it was more important than ever for them to earn extra money. Dolores Manzi, who for 10 years had cleaned houses so that she could be home when her children were younger, had built up a business running day trips to gambling casinos on weekends. Nick Manzi, a trucking executive during the week, now worked as her assistant. But their hard work and the expensive treatment didn't help Sam. His condition continued to deteriorate. He was in his room all the time, and even when I knocked at the door, he wouldn't answer. It was getting to the point where it was like living a nightmare in our house. The past year was, it was horrible. Afraid to be in your own house. Why? I never knew what he was gonna do. There was one incident where Sam, um, and he, Sam uh, threw a remote control changer at me. And you ducked, I and hope. I, and I ducked, and it put a dent in the wall. Um, and, and I had called 911, and he went to uh, Paul Kimball Crisis, Paul Kimball Hospital Crisis Center that night. You took him to a crisis center? Right. And said, I'm afraid of my son, uh, he's violent? Yes, he's being violent, and uh, more so than that, the look in his eyes when he was looking at me was, was one of, I was terrified. He looked as if he wanted to really hurt me bad. You're afraid he's going to do you bodily harm. He's a furious child. What did they say? They said that uh, the psychiatrist had evaluated him. He was evaluated. And that he doesn't appear to them that he would cause any harm and uh, released him back to us. In other words, just get on with it. He's not going to do you harm or himself. Right. Okay. So... Back he goes to Shoreline. Now, in late August, you were called by the Shoreline counselors for a meeting. And what did you hear at that point? That's when they told us that um, he had confessed that he had been seeing um, Steve Simmons for the past year. Now, the pieces began to fall into place, into a pattern of horror. It turned out that when Sam disappeared in August of last year, he had left the shopping mall with Simmons and had been taken to Simmons' home on Long Island. There were other incidents, when Sam would be dropped off by his parents at an amusement park, for example, only to be met secretly by Simmons and taken to a motel. We were devastated. We had no idea. And all I know now that all that isolation in his room was probably his pain and all that violence was his crying out for help. Under state law, the doctors at Shoreline had to report the sexual abuse to the police. Because of the locations of the crimes, Sam's meetings with Simmons, four police forces and three different prosecutors were involved. All wanted cooperation and statements. A lot of people talking to Sam, a lot of people asking questions. At some point. Detective George Noble of Monmouth County was the lead investigator. You had to question Sam about exactly what happened. What kinds of questions did you have to ask him? How, how personal were they? Well, obviously, when you're dealing with a sexual assault, the questions can be extremely personal. Some of them I cannot get into, as I'm sure you're aware. However, the locations of where these incidents took place, exactly what had taken place at the locations, uh, needed to be addressed. And he had to sit there and he had to describe everything, everything there was and that he did and where he went and um, times and uh, it was horrible. Everything just got so crazy that we forgot about Sam, his feelings. I mean, we forgot about what he needed at that time. 
In the beginning, Sam was totally cooperative with the investigation. He even agreed to have his phone tapped so that police could use him to trap Simmons in a sting operation. Were you ever concerned that you were putting too much pressure on this kid? No, not at all. He never gave any indication that he was under any form of pressure. He seemed cool, he seemed cooperative, and he, and without emotion. At all times. But all of that changed radically on September 22nd. That was a Monday, five days before the murder of Eddie Werner. Sam Manzi was on the road to destruction. Little Eddie Werner about to cross his path. What happened in the days before the murder? Why didn't Sam get the help he needed? It wasn't that his parents didn't try, as you'll see. Barbara continues. Sam Manzi was in therapy. He had admitted to a year-long homosexual affair with Steve Simmons, a man he had met on the internet. And he had agreed to help police snare the pedophile. But then Sam's parents received a troubling phone call. Dolores Manzi was called to a meeting at the Shoreline Behavioral Institute, where she learned from his therapist that Sam had alerted Stephen Simmons to the police sting operation. He had also smashed the wiretap equipment in his room. A year of sexual abuse and the strain of working with police for weeks had taken its toll on Sam. I thought that was the end of the line. I just knew at that time that this was it. This kid was... He had had it, and he wasn't going to do this anymore, and I, w I didn't even know what to expect from it. I just, it was like a feeling that I just had that, that something, you know, was terribly wrong here, and that he needed help bad. While we were in the office, I, um, the doctor was in there, and um, the counselor was in there, and I told her, don't make me take him home because something's going to happen. And they said, you have to, you're the mother. And I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not taking him home. And they also did advise me that if I didn't, that I could be prosecuted, or I, I could be arrested for abandonment. And I said, well, you do what you have to. I'm not taking him home. And that's when they kind of threw their hands up in the air, and they sent him to the crisis center. Once more, back at the crisis center, the doctors talked again with Sam. And once again, Sam's parents were told that Sam was neither homicidal nor suicidal and no danger to anyone. So you're a hysterical mother? They said that I was probably the one that needed the help and not him. But the crisis center agreed to keep Sam overnight. On Tuesday, the Manzies were told to be in front of a judge at family court the next morning. It was good news. They thought that at last they would get help, that Sam would be committed for long-term psychiatric treatment. Now, at that, Judge Sita yes. Yes. heard testimony from an intake worker named Paula Jacks. Sorry. From the testimony in court, I have uh, Miss Jacks' words. She admitted that she had barely talked to Sam. She said, quote, I didn't have time to get into all the details. Sam says he's not violent, he's their child, their responsibility. He's going to get better faster if they help. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing because I thought this was the procedure to go through to have Sam put someplace for a couple of days or a week until we can find a more permanent solution. Did you try to explain Sam's problems to the judge? I tried to explain the problems and at one point I was so frustrated I said I wish I knew this was going to be like this. I would have brought at least notarized statements from Dr. Brancato and Debbie Fuller. These are the people who had been working with him at Shoreline? At Shoreline because I had called them the day before and they said that they would support Sam being in a 24-hour program. The judge didn't want to wait to see these, these the testimonies? Judge, the judge discounted that. I started to explain some of the things that were going on and it, he cut me right off and went right over to Sam and started talking to him. You're not... Uh mentally disabled in any way you're not a psychopath no so you have some adjustment problems that appears to me that you're a fine young man and that the problem that exists in this family unit can be overcome if everybody will take a positive approach a positive attitude i'm going to make your parents take you home today 
The judge talks to you briefly. He talks to Sam and says what? You got two parents here that love you. Go home and be a good boy. Bottom line, at that point, we were thinking, well, there's all these professionals that had seen Sam and said that he's not homicidal, not suicidal, he's okay. We must be wrong. When I left that courtroom that day, I felt really bad for him. I felt like I, I was just, was it me? Was I, I the one that was overreacting to everything that was going on? You're the bad mother. And then I saw him that day standing in court, and I just looked over at him. And here everybody was saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with this kid. And I was saying, God, what kind of mother am I to think I have a kid that needs to be put away? As the Manzi family headed home that Wednesday, Stephen Simmons was placed under arrest. Records showed that he had served prison terms for two previous convictions involving sex with children. New Jersey authorities charged Simmons with nine criminal acts against Sam Manzi. So you're home with Sam. This is now Wednesday. What was Sam like from Wednesday to that horrible Saturday? It was good. Um, we had talked, and things went pretty good. They were, were like, I think it was Thursday and Friday were the best two days that we had in a year and a half with him. He even brought his dishes over to the dishwasher, which he hadn't done in years. It was now Saturday morning, and the Manzies months ago had arranged to take a busload of casino goers to Connecticut for the day. At that point, Sam seemed fine. Things were calm at home. Sam and was very docile those two days, and um, my daughter was going to be home a good part of the day before she went to work. Mm -hmm. And um, we really felt as if uh, there wouldn't be a problem. Sam was alone for a little over six hours. During that time, Eddie Werner started making his rounds of the neighborhood to sell candy and gift wrap for the PTA. He went door to door, and apparently, when he reached the Manzi house, he became the innocent tripwire for a simmering rage. Police believe Sam Manzi invited Eddie inside, knocked him unconscious, then raped and strangled him. The child's body was apparently stuffed in a suitcase and left on the side of the house. Later, Eddie's body was dumped into a nearby woods. You returned home at what time? Um... I think it was around 9 o'clock. How was Sam? He was in his room. Tell me what happened. I knocked on his door and told him we were home. And he just said, okay. And I said, Sam, tell me about your day today. You know? And he says, I'm on the phone. And usually when he's on the phone, that means you do not enter his room. He says, I'll talk to you later. And then what? Sunday morning we get up. And he asked um, to go to a friend's house. I was delighted. He was going to be with somebody his own age and have a good day. How did you hear about the murder of Eddie Werner? Sunday morning, there was a knock at the door. And there were uh, people going around putting flyers out. Two days later, police dogs helped locate Eddie's body some 200 yards from the Manzi's home. Police officers came to the house and said he was a suspect, and they wanted to take him down to the police station. Did you then, in your heart, feel, my Sam has done this? I had so many emotions. They were going everywhere that day. I, the whole way to the police uh, station, I, I, I didn't, I was out of my mind with just knowing that he was going down there to be questioned. Have you seen Sam since his arrest? Mm hmm Can you tell us anything about him? How is he? It's really hard to say because I'm not sure. Um, he doesn't talk. He doesn't talk. And you do you try to talk to him? You must. And ask him questions? Mm -hmm. And what does he say? I need help. He just says, I need help. Uh, the very first time I saw him, um, he walked through the door, and all I wanted to do was hug him and and just 
be with him. And he just looked me right in the face and said, I need help. Do you think he understands what's, what he's done? I'm not sure. I don't know. Does he show remorse? I'm not even sure of that. I'm, I'm not sure of anything because he just stares blankly ahead. Like we're not even in the room with him. Have any of the counselors from Shoreline come to see him? They refuse to treat him anymore, to see him. Is he getting any psychiatric help? Not right now. The prospects of treatment for Sam Manzi depend on his legal situation. The Ocean County prosecutor, David Millard, intends to charge the 15-year-old as an adult, meaning he could spend life in prison without parole. Sam's attorney, Michael Critchley, will mount an insanity defense if Sam is tried as an adult. Critchley feels that institutional treatment is the proper goal and that law enforcement bears some of the blame in this case. Mr. Critchley, what do you think about the idea of Sam being used as an undercover agent in a sting? It was a bad idea. And this is, again, a tragedy within a tragedy. The police intended to do good, but they end up doing wrong. And the facts tell you that. What do you say to people who say he murdered, he should be tried as an adult? I say to them, we punish bad people, not sick people. And under anyone's definition of sick, Sam Manzi was and is sick. If he goes to an institution, as opposed to doing jail time, he can walk, and then nobody's children will be safe. Valerie Werner, Eddie Werner's mother, would not talk to us, but she did speak briefly to WPVI television in Philadelphia. She sees Sam Manzi as a threat, not as a victim. My son, that's the victim. He's the one buried in a cemetery. He's the victim. And his brother, who no longer has a brother, and his sisters, who no longer have an older brother. This one won't even remember him. Nick and Dolores Manzi no longer live in their home. They and their 17-year-old daughter say they can't bear to. But when they went back one day to pick up their things, they discovered a makeshift neighborhood shrine for Eddie Werner. It was like driving into a little heaven. What did you do? I was dying. My daughter was there with us, and she asked it if she could go over and put a flower over there. On the shrine. And we placed some flowers on the shrine, and we said a prayer. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Well, our hearts sure go out to Eddie Werner's family, because nothing can bring him Absolutely. back. But Sam Manzi does seem like a child who's in desperate need of some kind of help, and still is, I guess. Is he getting any help now? Well, I understand that since our interview, which is, was done a week ago, the judge ha uh, a judge has now ordered a therapy for Sam Manzi. He's being kept in isolation at a juvenile uh, detention center, and the authorities are keeping close watch over him uh, in case he has suicidal tendencies. He's a, uh, a very disturbed sure young is. boy. But as you said, I mean, your heart breaks for the... For both families. Both families. Yeah. It's a story not only about the internet and its dangers, but about how the system failed a family.